Praise be Jesus and Mary. I'm David Rodriguez, Content Director of the Fatima Center, and we're building on a firm foundation as we study the basics of our Catholic faith. In the previous episodes, we have been looking at the central mystery of our Christian faith, namely the Blessed Trinity. Today, we will begin to probe more deeply into the second most important mystery of our Christian faith, namely the Incarnation or we might say the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, second person of the Most Blessed Trinity. We'll go ahead and begin with a prayer, and since we have gotten positive feedback on the Latin prayers, we will pray the Our Father, that prayer which our Lord himself taught us, and we'll pray it in Latin. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater Noster, qui es in celis, Sanctificetur nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cielo et in terra. Panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis odie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, sed libera nos a malo. Amen. Sancte Toma, ora pro nobis. In nome Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. So as I said, we're going to start looking now at who Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, is. And these two mysteries, that is, the Blessed Trinity and the Incarnation, really serve as the bedrock for the Christian faith. Okay, this is the heart of Catholicism, and when you understand these two doctrines, really, I think you can say that everything else is going to flow from them. And so they are the central source summit of our faith, of our belief. And we want to spend some time meditating upon these. And of course, both of these are divinely revealed by our Lord, Jesus Christ. Uh, human beings could not have come to know them on their own. They're so amazing. They're so far above us. They're so transcendent. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit here about the Incarnation because I do think here some people err they start seeing similarities between our teaching of the Incarnation, that Jesus Christ is both God and man. So, for example, what similarities here am I talking about? You might get people from the Greek uh, pagan mythologies that talk about how, you know, Zeus came and got together with so-and-so and they had a child, Perseus, and he's a demigod, a half-god, or, you know, all these other different little variations. There's many across all the false religions and the mythologies of past history, um, yeah, they might be, you know, have some similarities, but they do not express the mystery of who Jesus Christ is, the mystery of the Incarnation correctly. Uh, to really understand it, we need divine revelation, okay? And I guess that's another point we need to touch on first, uh, because some people, as we begin to look into this, you know, next time we're going to study a lot of the different histories that affected the church. Anytime you study church history, you're going to see these Christological heresies, heresies about who Christ is. And it is important to understand them. I think sometimes too many Catholics just think, oh, that's too hard for me, or oh, that's not important, or well, aren't we all just worshiping or, or praying to Jesus? Why, why does it matter all these sort of specific technicalities that you're getting into? So, before we ever get into those, I think it's important to touch on that so that you realize why we are going to dedicate this time and why, quite frankly, the Catechism dedicates this time to it. Uh, you can look, for example, at your, the Catholic Catechism from the Fatima Center. We are now on the second article of the Creed. That's on page 8, and it's questions number 31 through 46 that we're going to be discussing. I'm not going to read them straight to you because you have them there in the text. You can read them for yourselves. There's good material in that catechism. You can also get it online from our website. Or if you want the little booklet, just give us a call to Fatima Center. But I'm going to try to go into some of the other matters that the catechism doesn't cover, simply because there's so much to cover. I mean, what we cover here will also not be that much. But why? Why do we want to cover this? That's really important. I think. Fundamentally, and I think very simply, all of us should say, because this is the truth, 
Okay, we want to know the truth about who God is, about who Jesus Christ is. If God himself thought it was so important and so necessary to come down and reveal the truth to us, that already should sort of tip us off. This is important. Okay? Now, beyond that, we can then look at history. And as I said, there's been all these different heresies that have racked the church and schisms that have been created in the church. And the, cert and the church has suffered a lot and there's been martyrs, you know, great saints that have shed their blood for these truths. So, that also should sort of clue us in and tell us this is important, right? If you're just going to sort of dismiss this and say, oh, no, those little intricacies or, you know, nuances and it's too complex or we don't have to worry about these things, then you're sort of dismissing all the martyrs, all these church doctors, all the fact that, that they fought their lives for these truths. And you're even dismissing the fact that God himself has chosen to reveal this to us. So please, you know, don't do that. We are very much infected Unfortunately, as we've talked in previous classes, by the spirit of religious indifferentism. It does, it affects us, it seeps into us. When you study history and you see the battles they had over that one eye in Homo Usius or Homo Eusius, which we covered earlier on the Trinity, and you realize they had these tremendous battles over this and people died for this, you wonder, would we be willing to do the same? Or have we been so infected by indifferentism that the truth doesn't matter to us anymore, or not nearly as much? that who God is, who Jesus Christ is, does not matter to us that much anymore. See, that's the problem. Uh, again, if you've not seen those classes, those talks we gave on the heresy of indifferentism and the Pope's teaching against it, please do go back and watch those. Those are very important. And this is why I think, largely on account of that spirit of indifferentism, that today many people don't want to be bothered by these kinds of truths. What people in the past, our ancestors, the church doctors and the church fathers, what they understood better was that salvation really does depend on this. Okay, first, because salvation depends on our dogmas. Remember the Athanasian Creed. We have to hold the truths of the Catholic faith whole and entire without any change, without any alteration for salvation. So just on that level, salvation really depends on what we believe and what we believe correctly. And that's why they fought tooth and nail for it. They weren't fighting, they weren't trying to quibble, you know, over, you know, crossing T's and dotting I's. They were realizing eternal salvation is here at stake. And what they also realized is that what you believe really is going to affect you. It's going to affect how you live. We're not always aware of it. But believe me, it does. So many of the errors that are prevalent and that are rampant out there today, why we've got so much crisis, so much disinformation, why people uh, get duped so easily by what they hear, why people forget so easily what past, for example, politicians have done and what their record is, why people are out on the streets rioting and you know, destroying statues and trying to destroy history, and why people are advancing you know, a kind of socialism. All these kinds of errors, believe me, they stem back to what you believe. And when you have errors about who God is, it is inevitable that like a little dominoes, okay, you're going to have all these errors in how you believe. That even harkens back to the very first episode we gave on why we're going to be talking about these truths. So, what you believe about who Jesus Christ is, is going to affect your understanding of who God is and how God interacts with man and who man is. So, we're going to have a different understanding of what, how we are. That's why we've also gone over the Catholic anthropology. It's going to affect how you live your life how God relates to you, how you understand God's grace at work in your life. And that affects what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. How you pray to God, your morals, how you interact with others. It even affects how we build our society and the structures of our society. So for example, I won't go into this too much, but just so you can start thinking about it, I was talking to someone this past Sunday, and I mentioned that there are two, well, maybe three we could say, but I said the two doctrines that I think are so misunderstood today, and if we only understood those, so many things would be fixed within our Catholic Church, is ex ecclesia nulla salus. There's no salvation outside the church. And the social kingship of Jesus Christ. It was the feast of Christ the King, viva Cristo Rey. And so we're talking about those things. But really, we've largely forgotten those. Those are not being taught. Those are out 
outright denied and rejected by many prelates, and yet they're infallible. Social kingship of Christ, no salvation outside the church. Again, if you understand who our Lord Jesus really is, which is what we're going to be looking at, then those two doctrines make sense. But if you don't really understand who our Lord is, those doctrines don't make as much sense, and then you have huge problems. The third is a principle we've mentioned previously, I would say lex orandi, lex credendi, because it deals all about how we worship, that we must have the right worship, that as human beings we must worship God, we must worship Him rightly as God Himself has decreed, that will be affected by what we believe, and therefore we have to stand fast and hold on to all of our Catholic tradition and not allow any of it to be changed or to be mitigated or to dilute it, to be diluted. Uh, so really those, those are really, I think, the three big principles that Catholics today need to understand in order for us to sort of get the ship right. No salvation outside the church, the social kingship of Jesus Christ, and then the entire concept of lex orandi, lex credendi. And I bring all of this up because if we understand who our Lord is, then we're going to get those things right. And we should even be convinced of this just because our Lord himself poses this question, and it's a very important question. And our Lord doesn't just pose it to his own apostles. Honestly, if you think about it, he asks it uh, to each one of us on, a, on every day. You know, you wake up in the morning, our Lord is going to be asking you this. So let's go ahead and turn to uh, Matthew chapter 16. It's almost smack dab in the middle of Matthew's gospel. In some ways, this is perhaps the, the most important chapter, the most fascinating chapter. I say Matthew 16. Many of you might already be thinking about the papacy. Uh, the context here is also very important. So you always want to read a little bit before and a little bit after when you're reading the scriptures because in the context, you're going to see that Jesus has been working these great miracles. He has been curing people. Uh, the Pharisees have been laying traps for him. So we've got the whole problem with heresy and people trying to attack our Lord and false doctrines. It's in this concept. They're demanding signs. They want miracles. They want to force God to do what they want uh, so that they'll believe. And that's, of course, not what our Lord is going to do. And then we've also just had the miracle of the Eucharistic miracle where the loaves have been multiplied, right? All of this is that great context. And then our Lord is about to establish the papacy, you know, and his, the sure foundation of his church here in the chapter of Matthew 16. So the context is very important. And in the midst of all these things that are going on, we could say a summation of our Catholic faith. He will turn, we're going to read from Matthew chapters chapter 16, verses 13 through 17. He turns to his disciples and he says, And Jesus came into the quarters of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that the Son of Man is? And that is the question that I really want us to all realize that our Lord is always posing to each of us. He's asking you, who do you say that I am? Because that's going to affect what you think about God and what you think about yourself, what you think about your destiny, how you live your life and how you structure all your society and your family, every relationship you have. Who do you say that I am? Our Lord is asking each of us that question and we need to be able to answer it. We need to be able to answer it with the truth. Going back to the passage. But they said, some John the Baptist and others and some others, Elias, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Jesus saith to them, But whom do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered, and Jesus answering said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood have not revealed it to thee, but my Father, who is in heaven. And as we know, he goes on to establish the papacy. So, who is Jesus ultimately? He is the Son of the living God, the second person of the Blessed Trinity. And Simon Peter says this, speaking up for all of us, for you and for me as well, and man cannot know this. Your flesh, your human reason, your mind, that cannot know that. That has to come from God the Father. That has to come from divine revelation. So the simplest way of saying this, who is Jesus, as we would say, he is the Son of God. And I would also add, and the Son of Mary, 
We don't have this in this passage, Son of God and Son of Mary. But we know that Jesus is divine and human. He has a divine nature and he has a human nature, but he's only one person. Now, I think to, uh, Phil, to Peter, it was quite obvious that Jesus had a human nature, uh, which is perhaps why I didn't say that. But today and in centuries later, I think sometimes Christians can forget this. We begin to think that he is only God. That's one of the extremes and that's one of the errors. We always have to remember the humanity of our Lord as well. So that's why I think it's a great way of professing that he is son of God and son of Mary. Uh, in a nutshell, we might even say he is the son of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Uh, because in saying that even more succinct statement, when you say that he is the son of Mary, Mary who is a human, and Mary who is his mother, then you know he's got a human nature. But we also say that he's the son of the Blessed Virgin Mary, because she is a virgin before the birth of our Lord, during the birth of our Lord, and after the birth of our Lord, perpetual virginity. When you know that she's a perfect virgin, then you know, well, this has got to be divine. And so really when we profess our faith that he is the son of the blessed Virgin Mary, that she is his mother, the God-bearer, we have this full truth of who Jesus Christ is, both his divine nature and his human nature in the one person, second person of the blessed Trinity. We're going to flesh all that out in uh, the next few episodes because it means a lot, but I still just wanted to get back to the context because note where he said this. We already talked about how it's Eucharistic. Uh, there's the papacy, there's miracles. Again, there's the traps and the heresy that the Pharisees are trying to lay for him, the lay for our Lord, the false doctrines. But even this, he does it, it's <clears throat> he does it at Caesarea Philippi. Uh, that city is an important name because uh, first, just the name, Caesar, that's the Roman king and Philippi, that was the tetrarch of the Jews. So like the Jewish king. So he's taking all political authority, both the local and the imperial, and it's happening there. Again, the kingship of Christ. He's showing that he's the one who reigns there. Another name for this city was Pannonia, coming from the false god Pan, who when you look at the Greek pantheon, he looks the most diabolical. I mean, he's got horns, they give him a tail, they give him the feet of goats. Uh, I personally do believe that, you know, at some point in time, Satan, you know, appeared to people and took on this vision, and that's where they got the image of Pan, and that's where we still have it. Anyway, there was this great false worship of Pan there in this city, and along with that came some terrible diabolical rites, um, bestiality, all kinds of horrible things took place in that city in the time of our Lord. There was even a cave there where a lot of these sacrifices took place and this false worship of this uh, pan, you know, of Satan, really. And they believed that in this cave, that was a path down to the underworld. And they believed that their gods would sort of go into sleep during winter and that then they would have to be called forth back so that they would, you know, bring forth fruits and things in the spring. Similar to that uh, myth that many of us are familiar with in, from Greek mythology of Demeter and Hades. So you have all these weird cultic pagan rites with gross immorality, um, with the sort of allegiance to the state of Caesar and Philip in the name. All of that is coming together and this is a location where our Lord chooses to make the revelation about who he is, to demand it of his apostles, to demand it of us, and to have Peter open his eyes, his ears of faith, to that revelation from God the Father saying, you are the Son of the living God. So, uh, this is just a very brief introduction so that we know who Jesus is. We're going to continue to explore this in the next couple of classes, and hopefully also realize just how terribly important this is. Please do email me questions you might have on this. We can begin to address them. I do appreciate those. We'll put the email up on the screen. Uh, you can also email info at Fatima.org if that's easier to remember. Uh, the phone number is 1-800-263-8160. You can call us there. And of course, please do continue to support this apostolate. I'm very grateful for some of the things people have written. I mean, I'm getting emails from cradle Catholics who say they're very appreciative for these classes. There's so much that they're learning now that they hadn't known before, even though they've grown up Catholic, even though they've gone to Catholic school during their lives. So uh, these classes are helping. Hopefully they're helping you, but they're certainly helping others. And we want to keep them up on the air. Your contributions help towards this. And of course, please pray. Pray for the church. Pray for the Pope. Pray for the consecration of Russia. Many prayers are needed. We'll go ahead and close with our prayer. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Gloria Patri, et Filio, et Spiritui Santo, sicuterat in principio, et nunc et semper, et in saecula saeculorum. Amen. May you have a very blessed and graceful week, and continue to ask yourself, who do I say that Jesus Christ is?